Hello fiber friends and welcome to the Jillian Eve channel. I'm Evie and today we are going to have a fiber venture. You've seen me do a lot of spinning with spindles, spinning wheels that look like this lovely Ashford Elizabeth behind me, and e-spinners, but I have really wanted to try spinning with other styles of spinning wheels. The channel Good and Basic reached out to me. They want to create easier, accessible spinning tools, and they've created a 3D printed design for a Charka style of spinning wheel, and they sent me the pieces and said, have fun. I am really excited to share this adventure with you. We are going to build this Charka spinning wheel and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Charka because I feel like it definitely is iconic to India and it does need a little context in that regard. We're going to talk to a fiber friend about her own spinning journey and we are going to do some spinning with this Charka that we build. So stick with me. This is going to be a great fun fiber venture. I'm excited to get started. So let's put this Charka spinning wheel together. I was sent the pieces to this Charka uh, spinning wheel already printed. I do not personally have a 3D printer. You can purchase these from the Etsy shop for the Good and Basic channel. Um, I will have links for everything in the description of this video down below. Uh, you can also get the plans to print it yourself. And so I will also include some links for that, resources for that. Um, and so let's put this together. These are the pieces. They are bright gold. And I thought, you know what? We, we do a lot of natural spinning, natural wool colors, but this bright gold inspired me to be a little extra fancy with this one. And I know it came from a channel called Good and Basic and the whole idea of the Charka is that it's supposed to be accessible and easy to use, but I just couldn't help myself. I had to get a little fancy with it. And so I made it teal because that's one of my favorite colors next to purple and um, I covered it in glitter, <laughs> so it's definitely extra, but it's a lot of fun to use and I'm enjoying the sparkles. So you can design it however you want. You can be as basic as you like it to be, just a piece of wood, or you can get fancy and be a little extra like me and uh, decorate it however you would like. So that's a really fun part of this project. Here's how all of the pieces go together. I glued the base of each of the wheels down onto the board using epoxy. It's a strong glue and these base components are not going anywhere. I also have this piece over here that will be holding the spindle for the actual spinning. The shafts for each of these base components are made from welding rod. The other pieces, the other components for this wheel are uh, the, of course, the wheels, parts of it that need to turn, uh, sort of like whorls here. And then the part that will be holding the spindle that we'll be using to spin with, put our yarn on. Uh, and these I wanted to mention, the plastic is slippery. And so once I had my drive bands on here, it, it was slipping and nothing was really catching and turning. So you will need to come up with some solution to rough this up a little bit so your drive band will catch and hold. I solved the problem by putting a rubber band into the groove. I just slipped a rubber, rubber band over the whole thing and that is providing the friction that I need. Some other solutions, you could use a file or some sandpaper to rough it up. That might work for you and you could also run a bead of hot glue through the groove. I thought of doing that first but then I thought of making a mess which scared me a little bit so I went with the rubber band option but there are different solutions to make it work for you. It will need something though. So I put the rubber bands in the grooves and then I was ready to place them onto the base pieces. Now if you look at spinning wheels from India, and we're going to do that in just a moment, uh, you'll see that they tend to have the, uh, the wheel components tend to be closer together at one end of the charka, and the spindle tends to be further down 
on the other end of the charka. So I probably spaced mine out a little more than they needed to be and I probably have my spindle a little closer than it typically would be in a traditional charka setup. Um, some of the reasons I think for having them set up that way is uh, because of the book style to be able to fold it down and close it. So of course that would be a functional thing. If you're using something that closes up instead of a board, make sure everything will be able to fit with it when it's closed. But if you're using a board, experiment, play around, um, or look up some pictures of traditional charkas and align it to be that way. This is DIY. We can do what we want. But there's another solution that we had to come up with, and that is that the board would be sliding all over the table. There's different things you could do for that. If you have a clamp, you could just clamp it to your workspace, or I got some some feet just screwed them into the bottom and they're sticky enough that it it holds on my table and it doesn't slide around while I'm spinning and I wanted to have the feet in case I wanted to spin sitting on the floor or wherever I felt like it it gave me some more options to move around with this um, than having a clamp so that worked for me all right let's talk a little bit about the history of the charka this is an image of another style of charco spinning wheel where the wheel is turned with a hand crank. The fiber is spun onto a spindle. I want to talk about the charco's connection to India's freedom movement and give a little bit of context for this historic textile tool. The Swadeshi movement was part of the Indian independence movement, the goal of which was to end colonial British rule in India. The Swadeshi movement's connection to the charka had to do with a call to end India's reliance on British materials, including fabric. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the leaders in the movement, wrote, The spinning wheel represents to me the hope of the masses. The masses lost their freedom, such as it was, with the loss of the charka. The charka supplemented the agriculture of the villagers and gave it dignity. To the freedom movement, decolonizing India meant shifting the production of cloth and other goods away from British factories and returning production to local craftspeople and artisans. It meant promoting independence through self-reliance, therefore cutting off revenue streams to England generated by dependence on British manufacturing. We obviously can't cover all this history in one little YouTube video, and we are mostly focused on the spinning here. As with all histories, there is nuance and complexity. Some of Gandhi's contemporaries thought his obsession with charka spinning was a distraction to their ultimate goals of independence. Other people saw spinning as more than just a tool for self-reliance and made charka spinning part of their daily spiritual practice. But there is no denying that the charka, as well as hand-spun and hand-woven khadi cloth, became symbols of India's freedom. The national flag of India, adopted in 1947, is by law to be made of hand-spun, hand-woven khadi cloth. I was chatting about spinning with one of my friends, the spinning professor over on Instagram, and she said that she had a personal connection to charka spinning through her mother. So I am very, very excited to welcome my friend, and I am going to let you introduce yourself and tell us who you are, what you do, what you study, all of that. So oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I am uh, Radhika Gajala, and um, I guess in my official life, I'm, an, I'm a professor of media and communication at Bowling Green State University, uh, but in my life in this context, I'm a spinning professor. <laughs> and that's also how people can look you up if they want to follow you on Instagram. Yes, yes. And so we, we started chatting just because we connected over textiles and spinning. Mm -hmm. And um, we were just visiting and then you shared a little bit about your own family history. And I said, Oh, Oh, look at this wonderful <laughs> connection. And so you've so graciously agreed to come and share some of your story um, with us well, in regards to the charka. Yeah. Well, well, it's not a major big story. It's not my story. I mean, it's basically the reason that the charka was at home. I mean, I've seen the charka at home ever since I can remember is that um, my father and mother are of the generation that followed the whole Gandhi Satyagraha in India. And it was at that time that 
uh, I guess, um, um, men and women were picking up the charka to um, do their morning, you know, ritual of, I don't know how long it was that they would do, you know, spinning. Um, and I guess at that time, um, my mother became pretty proficient at it. And she started teaching the people that came to her to learn. Um, she started holding charka classes in her, um, you know, wherever she was in her village or in, in Bombay, wherever. Um, so these are stories I heard from them. I'm the youngest of six. So I was born way after all this activity. Um, and I, every now and then my mother would bring out the charka maybe once a year for some spinning some cotton yarn for some you know, religious thing that you would do. And the other thing though, is also I, as a researcher of media and communication and technology, uh, in early 2000s, I was doing um, ethnographic research in handloom communities in India. Um, I was um, basically going to the handloom villages with a group of nonprofit uh, organization officers who were working with them to connect them to the market. So I watched them do the weaving and I, I was even more fascinated. And I was like, oh God, I need to re recover some of these aesthetics in my life. So I used to ask my mother when, when I finally, this my mother lived till, she, I was fortunate to have her till she was 93, uh, a couple of few years ago, 2017. But, so once I learned to spin, I knew the process. So I would ask her all these questions. She was like, why is she asking me all these questions now? And I'm so tired and old. Anyway, she would tell me <laughs> some stories. Um, so she would be like, why are you spinning so much? What are you going to do with that yarn? I mean, taking my top, 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 you know, top world spindle and spinning and spinning whenever I visited or she was in the hospital or something like that. She's like, what do you do with all the yarn you spin? And, think, do you want, and then she would see me kind of looking on my phone. And she said, who's that on the phone that you're always kind of taking a picture and sharing to? <laughs> I was like, she said, you know, why don't you sell that? Yeah, I was like, who'd buy my spun yarn? Are you kidding? And then she said, make something with it. I said, no, I'm too lazy to make something with it. So <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, you came to spinning through your own journey and yet you were still able to connect with your mother who was also a spinner. And that's a really cool thing. But then that's one regret I have is that if only I'd kind of learned earlier, we might've had more conversations. And if I'd learned earlier, um, I would have actually spoken to some of the spinners in those communities that I was going to, because as it was, as a researcher, we would mostly look at the weavers. Mm. And, the questions that I would probably ask both the weavers and spinners now would be more involved because I know how the process is. I'll just show it to you. Like this. Wow. Wonderful. And I haven't, yeah, I haven't set it up in a while. Let's not go on and off. You know, I think we all have this when we, um, you know, um, there we go. I don't know where it went. Sorry. Um, so yeah. Anyway, that would be called a book charka. Is that yes, right? Because it's it... a briefcase. This is a briefcase charka. The book charka is smaller. Oh, um, okay. And, okay. And the story with this is, um, it was the charka designed. Um, the design of it was uh, was the design for the charka that um, Gandhi used when he was in jail. Um, in in, in, and it's called the Yaramda Jail. I'll write it down for you at some point. Um, and so, and I know that I kept for old time's sake, I treasured some of the yarn that my mother had spun. Oh, yes. It's on this. I kept it. I didn't, I'm not, I don't use that. I have my other um, things for it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting how similar, though. I mean, just the, the very basic mechanics of what you have there yeah. is very, it's I what, mean, it's, what, what was what was reproduced for you in the 3D? Right. It is very similar 
um, mm -hmm. just in the in the basic shape of it, the mechanics of it, the the functionality of it. I, I think. Yeah. Right. I just use some crochet cotton. Oh, absolutely. That's what we it have works. here too. Actually, my brother um, got a plaque for it. But I think it might it might have been used during the Quit India movement, which is which is when the height of this was. But I think the Sherpa itself was designed a little earlier or acquired. Now this yarn, can you see it? Yes. This yarn was spun by my mother. And I aspire to spin this kind of yarn on the Cherka, but I'm not that good on the Cherka. And this is the kind of uh, treasures I hold on to. It is a <laughs> treasure. Like, it's, it's like, that's yarn my mother spun. So this is it yarn is a that treasure. I spun. This is the yarn that I spun, which is not as good as hers, but that'll do. <laughs> it's yeah. wonderful. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me and for sharing some of your story. I think that just all of these connections are so cool and so important because the you know when we go to do the research and learn about spinning, especially not industrialized spinning, but spinning that was done just by individuals for either their own household to clothe their own household or for their own, for their, you know, their own work, not industry work. There's just such a lack of information out there. And if we don't start gathering that, if we don't share our stories, and if we don't connect with community, with each other, with other spinners, the generations that come next are going to say, what were they even doing? You know, <laughs> it's important yeah. to, to share these stories, I feel. And, um, true. and true, true, true. Yeah. To maintain okay, that younger knowledge. People. Mm -hmm. I think younger people get it more. Yeah. Nowadays, some of them. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. So, so nice talking to you. Thank you so much. Yep. Here is the Charka spinning wheel. We are ready to get it all set up for some spinning. So to do that, we are going to need to add the spindle over here and the piece that holds that. It looks like this and it uses a rubber band for the tension. It's a really clever design. So I'll show you how that works once we actually start the spinning. This will just slide right on there with a piece of wire just like that and it's ready to go. The rubber band goes over this little notch right here. Okay, and now we're ready to put the drive bands on. And the final drive band is what will hold the spindle onto the whole system. This is just some dishcloth cotton that I'm using. It works really well. So to add this, it's going to go from the big wheel to the smaller section of this one right there and so i will put it on like that and then put this part down on the base and that's sort of the easiest way i found to do it and it takes a little fussing but as soon as you get it on there you'll be set there we go all right so now we can turn the charka um, just by putting our finger in the little divot and spinning this around. The next piece goes around the top. The top whirl here. So each time we are going from larger to smaller, we are putting more rotations into the spindle. That's what makes this a very fast spinning wheel. Now here is something interesting to note. Whichever way you attach it around the spindle affects if this is going to spin, this would be in a counterclockwise direction. But if we flip it over, even though everything else is turning the same way, suddenly we are going in a clockwise direction. So be aware that you can change the direction of your spin uh, by twisting this band one way or the other. I want to have my yarn in a Z direction, and so I'll have this band 
um, oriented this way. <laughs> now, to attach the spindle, I'm going to lift up this little piece right here and let that set right in the groove. And now, when I turn this larger wheel with my finger, I am getting twist from, I'm getting twist in the spindle. I've already done some practice spins with this charka. I spun some wool roll eggs and this was the result. It's a little messy, but uh, it worked really well. And I got this nice little cob on here and this was just, I think, one roll egg. So that was pretty cool. And then I've also done some cotton spinning. Of course, cotton would be the traditional fiber to spin on a charka spinning wheel. The high twist that you can get on the spindle is perfect for the short stapled cotton and it makes a really nice thread. It's really important to talk about fiber preparation when spinning with a charka. A charka because you're going to have one hand turning the wheel to provide the twist. It means that everything you're doing with your other hand will have to be done with one hand. That means that we are going to be doing an unsupported long draw as we provide the twist and to do that we need to have roll eggs. The cotton that I have is in this lovely um, sliver preparation but I've had trouble drafting it with the charka and just having it in this preparation so this has been great for using with my e-spinners I can do it with a treadle wheel but it requires a lot of treadling to get the twist I need um, so I am transforming this fiber from this sliver preparation to a puni Poonies are what we would call a very tightly rolled rollag um, from cotton. Poonie would be the correct term for that. I felt that it was unnecessary to bring the fiber across the whole entire blending board. So I just took the sliver and just added some little pieces and then I am brushing them. It's opening them up, floofing them up all of those fibers and I'm just brushing them down into the blending board. This is not ideal. <laughs> Cotton hand cards would be ideal or at least regular hand cards even uh, with sort of the wider wool variety would probably also work in a pinch but those are packed up because we're moving so. I am making do with the tools that I have right now, which I guess is the spirit of the whole thing. So DIY and use the tools you have. All right, so I have these two sticks and I am sandwiching the fluffy end of this cotton down here um, with these sticks. So I am sitting next to, I'm facing that way, and I have my hand right here ready to provide my twist. And I am doing this unsupported long draw, which sometimes I might need to sort of stop and double draft a little bit, get me going. And once I have all the twist I need, I'm going to untwist a little bit so it comes off that tip there. And then roll it up to form my cob and bring it back to the tip. And then I'm ready to draft again. Except I'm not because I made a slub and I'm gonna fix it. <laughs> If you are spinning with a charka and you feel like you're stuck at the uh, drafting point, you can give it a little untwist with your fingers and then I find that just doing a little tiny draft there uh, breaks up whatever slub or friction was binding it up and then I'm able to continue again. If you are learning to spin with a charka and you feel like your drafting is kind of a mess, like mine is at this moment, I'm practicing, I'm learning, I'm not used to spinning with this type of spinning wheel. That's okay. Um, one, one way that I've found is working for me, 
I would compare this sort of to a park and draft kind of method. If you're learning a spindle, you might be familiar with that. So what I'm doing is adding a bunch of twist to it, and then I'm able to spread out that twist by using two hands to draft. So if the unsupported long draw is really intimidating to you, if you haven't figured out that technique yet, um, and if this is your first spinning adventure, it could be something that's a little tricky to get a good feel for. Um, you can do this kind of method where you add a bunch of twist, and then you're gonna draft out and spread that twist along your yarn and you can fix those slubby bits. You can um, pull those thinner and get things how you want it to look. Add more twist. Make sure it's strong and it's not gonna pull apart and then wind it on the spindle and do it again. I definitely think part of my one hand drafting trouble that I'm experiencing here is simply because of the fiber preparation. I messed up a sliver on my blending board trying to make the pony. So if you can get your hands on some actual cotton cards or some properly prepared ponies, I would say that would probably be ideal for doing an unsupported long draw type of spin with a charcoal wheel. Someday I will come and revisit this when I've had more practice with cotton. Cotton is tricky if you're new to it, but anything is tricky if you're new to it. I don't think that cotton is any more or less difficult than another fiber if you have the tools you need to prepare it properly. <laughs> so if you'd like to see some more close-up pictures of the fiber I've been spinning with this Charka spinning wheel, my Instagram is the place to go and do that. I will see you in the next video. Happy spinning fiber friends.